Should I forget? Recording in progress. Okay, everything perfect. Everybody, welcome to the webinar. Maria, if you see, since you are a co-host, if you see anybody in the waiting room while I... I Yes, let them in while I say a few words about you. So Maria has presented herself as a practicing uh, English for as a foreign language teacher, but she is a lecturer in the English Studies Department of City of uh, of City College in the, the Europe campus of the University of York. And to begin with, she is the owner and managing director of Input on Education. And that's where we started with our webinars. I will tell you in a moment. Uh, and Input on Education provides academic and business support services for foreign language schools. And as, uh, as some of you probably know, Maria frequently presents at conferences and she also writes articles related to her areas of interest. And these are materials evaluation and adaptation, digital teaching, uh, construction of teacher identity. Uh, Maria is also, or has been, right now she is involved with IATF membership committee, and she moderates <clears throat> webinars for IATF uh, International, uh, so uh, you can meet her there, <clears throat> and she, she used to be heavily involved with the running of TISO Macedonia race, Northern Greece, uh, uh, so that is another aspect. And I here comes the most important section, and I am even going to provide you in the chat box with information about Maria's webinars, because Maria has been offering webinars for IATF Poland since the very beginning of the series. In fact, she created the series, presenting the very first webinar on uh, in January 2018, uh, titled Teacher Development for Teachers at Different Stages of Their Professional Careers. And that webinar, alongside with the next webinar, also in January, January is for Maria, so that we begin the new year with the right people and in the right mood, talking about the right topics. So uh, in, in 2019, she presented the webinar Engaging Learners in Active Learning, and that was still via Maria's website, Input on Education. Yes, uh, so uh, uh, um, th th that's how hospitable Maria is. And then we continued on Click um, Meeting Platform with Teaching and Learning, Cause and Effect of Process or Interaction. And this webinar is available in the set of webinars recorded on our, uh, in our files on YouTube. So I will provide you with the link. You can go there and you can watch it. Then 21, maximizing the potential of your course book. Then 22, I teach, you learn or not. And then in 22 also, we started the new academic and school year with uh, Maria. So uh, we started on the right foot because the title of the webinar was activities to start your school uh, year on the right foot. So you can watch this one too. And tonight, Maria will inspire us with uh, ide her ideas concerning sustainable writing at level B2 to C2. C2. And uh, in her introductory remarks, Maria wrote that writing is very, very complex process involving productive uh, tasks, uh, but also involving all kinds of other skills. Uh, it's particularly challenging, especially for weak learners. And it should begin with understanding of the topic and the task and uh, fitting within the time limit. So there are a lot of skills involved that need to be controlled. And Maria will teach us how to streamline the process uh, of, of this writing. So over to you, Maria. Thank you so much. How can I parallel this warm introduction? It's been an honor uh, to be invited in January and last year in September as well to present for one of my favorite associations 
in Europe, I had TEFL Poland, um, due to my involvement with TESOL Macedonia Thrace Northern Greece and the fact that we are back in action and I am a chair again, we faced some problems just before the COVID lockdown, the first one. I've come in touch with many wonderful European associations that I wouldn't have met, but IATFL Poland has a special place in my heart as I am trying to test the um, hypothesis of self-organized learning environments by teaching myself Polish without the assistance of a teacher. So yes, uh, I know that I haven't been to an IATFL Poland conference for some time now, but this is not because I don't love Poland the same way that I have always loved this country and respected its history and the great contribution it has had to European civilization. It's been because, oh my God, energy and wars and COVID have made traveling really, really problematic. But here we all are taking advantage of technology. And thank you so much for this beautiful welcome. It's, uh, as I said, it always makes my January to know that I'm going to be online with uh, so many of you. So today, um, I thought we should uh, have a look at writing. Now, um, you don't really, if you want to unmute your microphones and speak and you can do this, that's okay. But if you'd rather just uh, use an emoticon or write something in the chat, that's also okay. Um, to what extent do you agree that writing is an unsustainable task? Uh, and you might wonder, what do you mean by unsustainable? Um, I mean that it takes a lot of time on our part, and then it takes a lot of time on the, uh, from the learners, and there is effort involved in both ends. And a lot of times there is also frustration, and sometimes we would like to spend more energy and more time on specific tasks and yet we can because there are other things and everything is pressing so to what extent do you agree please feel free to use emoticons or to simply use the chat I'm not, I can't see. So, mm -hmm. oh yes. Oh my God, your students have discovered it. We had um, a session at university uh, about how we are going to deal with it because we are very big on um, students submitting their own work. We are against plagiarism, collusion. Obviously it's a university, uh, but right now we are, um, e we are left without any power in our hands. Turnitin cannot touch the um, GPT. And it, it might be, I'm not sure, I'm afraid to say it, the end of the run for writing. Are we going to see people who do not speak English write in English and produce texts that actually make sense, not texts that look like, you know, patchwork and do not make any sense in terms of discourse or supporting arguments? I can see that some colleagues have mentioned um, how challenging it is, uh, time consuming, the hardest of all four skills. Um, of course, uh, student Deep Right also launched a, a couple of days ago. Okay, I can see that we are on the same wavelength. So now moving on, let's brainstorm. What are the problems we face if we take out any ready-made solutions? I mean the police work, as I would say, uh, in other circumstances. Can you think for a minute, if you had to name the number one problem, uh, what would it be for you? Number one problem when teaching writing. Student fi students find it boring. And part of the boredom might be the fact that it takes them quite a while to see that they are making progress. Also, this may become proportionately more difficult as they uh, climb the CFR levels. Relevance. Um, and then we get all the little bits of language or a grammar, organization. Everything keeps popping up. Lack of motivation. The students don't read. 
And yes, they don't read. They don't read the topic. They don't read the, the instructions. Yes, I can. I definitely uh, agree with all the points that have been mentioned so far. Okay, students have difficulties with the structure, the new vocabulary to use. Yes, I mean, one of the things that I noticed in myself, I think that um, one of the things that makes me feel I've chosen the right job is that I have very clear memories of myself studying myself as a learner. When I took the B2 exams, back then it was called a uh, uh, lower exam, um, I told my teacher when I was little, I made progress because I learned new vocabulary. Now I study and I study, but I don't feel that my vocabulary is changing. And this was true, not only about me, but for many other people at this level. So uh, we are probably facing the same uh, conundrum. Uh, is writing meant to be a talent? Is it meant to be unteachable? Um, and then this notion that writing might be related with talents and in this sense, it might, it's not fair to compare people and assess them because their talent is their talent. Um, that led the uh, Cambridge Examination Board to remove story writing from uh, the upper part, from, from the C2 exam, as the demands are so high and people almost produced short stories. And not everybody can write a short story. And the general English exam uh, shouldn't assess people for their ability to compose discourse that is meant to be read for pleasure. So if we look at it from another angle, if we see this as factual writing, does it change anything? So pretty much this is what we are going to consider. We have given a given syllabus. We have given hours. Usually we are always uh, up, a uh, up against the deadline and we have to teach a lot of skills, part of which is teaching writing. Uh, in most exams these days, uh, especially the, uh, particularly the ones that I teach, writing is one of the four skills that receives equal attention. I cannot sacrifice time for any other skills just to teach writing. So let's examine a little bit. Why did I call writing an unsustainable task? Uh, first of all, to uh, quote Harmer, it calls back to the student's mind all language pre-taught, present, and available. So the more, the, the wider and richer the language the learners can exhibit, the better for the learners because they can cover the topic better, they can make their language, their discourse sound natural, and also um, they can produce a text that is interesting to read. I think as teachers, uh, we always appreciate it when students write something which is either uh, it has an opinion, it has a point, uh, as well as uh, a real connection with their own opinions and beliefs. So from what I said just before, it's obvious that the connection between what we write and how much we know about how this topic is related to the world and the world as it is nowadays are actually interlinked. Topic familiarity is very important. Um, the other day, my students and I uh, worked on a topic that included the term soft skills not transferable, but soft skills. And I asked the students, do you understand the term? And some of them mentioned something that might have been close to what we consider soft skills, but they weren't clear. And we discussed how this would have affected them under exam conditions. And they all mentioned the same thing. I wouldn't, if, if it was up to me, I wouldn't have chosen this topic. Unfortunately, that was an IELTS exam. So it was the essay part. So if they were under exam conditions, they would have to deal with it one way or another. So for the learners to be able not only to read the rubric, but also to understand it in depth means a lot and in a way determines how well they can cover the topic. 
Um, another issue I think Rob mentioned relevance. These days I find it very hard to relate things to learners' interests. Uh, it seems that everything has been discussed. It seems that they have been listening to a lot of innovative things. I cannot complain. My secondary students are generally quite tolerant. They go along with my experimentation. Uh, but in um, at university level, things start becoming a bit more difficult. Learners are harder to motivate. So this is another issue. Are the learners interested in writing? If we look at B2 exams, there is another issue that crops up. Would they be asked to write a text like this at their age in their own language? Or is this something that would never, they would never come across? Therefore, it's contrived, unnatural, and cannot lead them to write well. Writing examines critical thinking skills. And there are times when learners find it particularly hard to think critically. It's been mentioned about uh, uh, when we brainstorm that organizing ideas, prioritizing thinking of how to group ideas um, are not always easy and self-explanatory. In essence, writing includes two levels of learning. First of all, the learners have to activate their strategies, we, which we teach in class, but unfortunately, they don't practice at home. So in class, I may ask the learners to follow a very step-by-step -step analysis of the topic. I insist that they produce a very quick, I would even say pre-described and often practiced short plan. But I know that when they are left to their own devices, they do not activate these strategies and they revert to strategies they have applied previously without knowledge of the complexity of writing. And therefore, whatever they have learned or whatever they could accomplish is lost. An example I can uh, use, we know that the brain is as much a muscle as any other one of our muscles. When we start an exercise routine, the first thing we need to do is warm up. So the best warm up before writing, well, not in class, but when writing under exam conditions, is to spend five quiet minutes without writing, quietly planning, noting down, jotting down a few ideas so that things can become a little bit more visible, less cloudy, less foggy, and more concrete. If students don't do that and they rush into writing and Believe me, I've seen it happen. I was invigilating public exams. I had only 13 candidates that I had to watch. And it was amazing that the moment the topic was read and the timer was set, 13 pens hit the paper and they all started nowadays, nowadays, in our day and age, in today's society. And I was like, plan for God's sake, just plan for one quiet minute. Now, if they don't plan, odds are that the second page of the writing is going to be a tiny bit better, if not a lot better, not because they've grown better, but because they flex their muscles, they've warmed up. And personally, I've seen it many times, students producing a second page of the essay, which is a far cry from the first one. And when I confront them with the fact, they say, uh, it, I'm the same person. Yes, I know you're the same person. This teaches you something. It teaches you not to rush into the writing bit and to activate strategies. Of course, here the main problem and the main scarecrow is the timer. But as I mentioned before, there is a very creative part in writing. Even if we write something factual, for those of you who enjoy blogging, for those of us who enjoy blogging and article writing, we do know that even when we write an article about, I don't know, continuous professional development, how difficult it is to uh, travel to all conferences that one would like to attend, still things are hard. Uh, we still think in a creative way. We don't simply follow a plan. We don't fill out a form. 
So we can see that this is a not simply a complex task, but a task that has many different aspects and there are many cogs which need to be taken into consideration and carefully oiled so that they do not hinder the work of the system. It's also difficult to pinpoint which of the cogs doesn't work. Perhaps it's not that the student doesn't have ideas. It might be that the student doesn't immediately understand the topic, which is also part of the difficulty. And of course, it is a stressful uh, task, which is uh, where there are uh, rules regarding timing and students have to be uh, very careful not to exceed the time limit. At the same time, our teaching time is governed by clocks and uh, syllabi and deadlines. So the first thing is that we have to spend a little bit of time teaching the topic. And this takes a long time. I mean, for those of us who teach B2 to C2 classes, there is no way we can go for a quick speaking activity. Even the quickest brainstorming takes a little bit of time. And the more the learners become ambitious with it, the more we get into uh, encouraging them to speak, which is a good thing. They should. Now, working on the topic that pre, uh, uh, that lead in stage, the pre uh, introduction to the model stage, for me, is made of gold because it allows me to do so much work with the learners. And this work is all going to be used when they write their own topic. But it's not the only thing I have to do. The learners also have to work on the model provided. And I am a, a believer in models. I am going to talk about their usefulness in another slide. The work on the model should, shouldn't stop the learners from working on their own topic. I sometimes fear that course books, the way they are organized right now, uh, make the learners work more on the given model and less on their own writing. I think it's time we flip the classroom. Learners can prepare the work on the model from home because this is usually guided and they can have a little bit of that prepared, the guided part, and then we can use more time in class to get them to do micro writing. I am a firm believer in micro writing. I'll come back to it when I give examples. Finally, it is time consuming to correct and give accurate, well balanced, and accurately formed feedback. It's easy to scan an essay and give, you know, a, uh, a quick uh comment but it's quite difficult to understand how the exam the relevant exam board's uh, specifications work and this actually should be part of our training and we should um actively try to find sessions usually those provided by the exam boards that take us into the workshop of the materials of the test designers and get us to think in the way the assessors think. Um, just to mention, uh, personally, I'm a bit of a strict assessor. I prefer to be guarded. I prefer to give a more cautious grading and make my learners think, oh, she's so mean, uh, and prepare them for something better when they take the exam, rather than be too generous with the marks and let them uh, feel that they have, uh, they can pass. It's, it's all easy and nice and there are no problems. So time is in the center of the problem, I think. Now, I said before that writing has uh, two aspects, the activation of the strategies and the creative part. In the same vein, productive tasks are always connected with the two sides. The language, and this is why our job is never boring, as language teachers, we don't teach just one uh, discipline. We don't, uh, we're not confined in one subject. We may be talking about environmental problems in one unit and then the identity of people in modern globalized society, the, the next. This makes our lives and our education, our own education, 
a lot richer. But think of the content that comes out of this. Uh, and the fact that learners have to come up with original ideas, they have to create cogent, but also suitable arguments that are not repetitive. I've noticed that several times learners cannot see the difference. Uh, they cannot spot that they are simply saying the same thing twice in different words. They need to use their common sense. I mentioned before that they need to understand how the topic is related to um, uh, th the real world and how they shouldn't exaggerate, which they frequently do. I have a nice joke to share later on. Um, they should also be specific and cover the topic. Uh, but at the same time, they have to think of the language. And the language is all about the things that each one of you mentioned before when we were listing difficulties. Regarding uh, the way they use the language, they need to show some sort of uh, awareness of how their language needs to grow. This is very difficult, especially as learners come out of B1 and they move on to B2 exams and then to they gradually climb those very high steps to go from uh, B2 to C1 to C2. But we very frequently do not see them venture out of their comfort zone, to try different structures, to attempt more complex sentences, or perhaps use uh, cleft sentences for emphasis, or even use a complex period that, is, that makes sense and doesn't break up in the middle. The same applies for word order. Uh, many of my learners make transference errors. They think in terms of Greek. Greek is a language with many endings. Everything is conjugated, much like in Polish. So this means that they think that they can uh, put the, the verb and the noun wherever they wish. Uh, obviously, this is one of the first things that we deal with between B1 and B2. But in some weaker learners, this might continue. Or the more complex the structure, the less they understand uh, if they're using double subjects. For example, many students create uh, impersonal structures, but they also give a subject later on, especially in, in passive sentences, how appropriate their language is. Uh, for example, it's quite difficult to get them to understand that we, we're very careful about the adjectives that we use and how repetitive they may be in terms of vocabulary. Most learners fall in love with a phrase and then they keep using it again and again and again, but this becomes uh, tiring, repetitive, unnatural, therefore they lose points. And there in the intersection, we see the things that come in between. Uh, for me, one of the most important audience, uh, of the most important audience awareness. Uh, I'll give you an example, uh, letters to the editor. Obviously my students who are very young, but they are at C2 level. In Greece, they take the C2 exams at the age of 14, 15, if they are lucky, sometimes younger. Uh, and uh, this means that they would never understand what a letter to the editor is. So first of all, I have to start by explaining who the editor is, what he or she does, if he or she has actually written the article about which you are writing the commentary, and whether or not this person uh, necessarily knows what which article you refer an editor needs specific information to understand which of the many articles he or she has published in the publications he or she supervises um, can, uh, can track down. So audience awareness is very important. Style and register, major problem, the use of you in essays um, and the use of um, vocabulary that would never be seen uh, in a formal content, context, for example, words like uh, gonna, wanna, kids, uh, stuff, despite the fact that we have a list of vocabulary that should never appear, this very easily flies out of the window as they write. Um, text organization as well, and the fact that text needs flow that shouldn't be created with linkers and discourse markers, but with clever paragraph organization and the creation of carefully constructed topic sentences. 
finally, I left the first for last, understanding the genre, understanding where you can be funny and where you would never be funny, uh, understanding what is purely factual, such as a report, and what might give you a, some room for a personal, even a more emotional context, uh, comment, for example, uh, writing a letter to the editor to give your opinion on a social topic. Um, I'm not sure. Let me check the chat to see uh, if there are any uh, comments that require. I don't see any questions for the time being. Of course, we can discuss things um, later as well when, when I finish. I'm going to use this topic from Cambridge Proficiency. This is from Express Publishing Practice Tests. I find this topic very exciting. I'm going to give you a quiet moment to study the topic, and then I will um, present the what I find interesting. So clearly, this is uh, Cambridge Proficiency Writing Part 2. Can you guess which uh, vocabulary items would might cause problems? Premises, definitely. Yes. So if you could vote on a Linkert scale regarding how relevant and exciting this topic is for 14 year olds renovation yes as well um what would you vote the age group of my learners is 14 to 15. how interested would they be to a company that has renovated its premises pre-work students cannot relate Zero, zero, yep, yep, indeed. So this topic poses multiple challenges. Uh, if we turn to the genre, I truly believe that we do them a great favor by teaching them presentation skills and report writing skills. I sometimes joke with my learners and tell them that no matter which exam you take, you will learn to write reports and proposals because this is part of what you will be doing when you start working. But regardless of what I tell them, they don't actually have work experience and they do not know how important it is for a company to have uh, some sort of decent working environment. So the way we went about it, we started by getting the learners to read the topic and identify potential problems. Uh, I had already familiarized them with the layout of the report. And then we completely forgot the topic. We only got the key idea, a renovation of the premises, better to work attractive for clients. And then we started by discussing the whole issue of the work environment. Uh, we talked about open plan offices, their up, their pros and their cons, and uh, why might some people find them a bit too uh, difficult to uh, work day in and day out. Um, students took notes, obviously. Uh, they worked in small groups to produce ideas, and sometimes we just brainstormed all together. Uh, at some point, students were asked to work the, to work in their groups to list some changes that would make the building better as a place for work and the building more appealing for uh, the clients. And they came up with uh, some ideas, but at this point, obviously, the vocabulary kicked in. Um, they wanted to know vocabulary such as flooring or, for example, carpenters installed or we uh, we had the uh, uh, windows changed uh, crystal panels were used to allow more light into the front desk so several of these elements were highlighted on the whiteboard and students were 
a little bit better uh, informed about the topic. We planned the report in class, uh, always making sure that the learners understand that the topic itself guides them and gives them the titles for the main part paragraphs. But of course, they rephrase these. And of course, uh, I we wrote an evaluation overall, but I left them to their own devices to choose whether they would be favorable about the changes that they presented or whether they would find one or two negative aspects. My advice was that in every paradise, there is a little bit of a problem. So don't present an ideal picture. It might not be believable. You could mention that one or two people have complained about this and that. So when I received the work, it was uh, quite good. Uh, and most of them had uh, used the notes that we had in class. Now, uh, obviously, the quality of the reports I received was such that they would pass if they uh, took the exam. The question is, would they have passed if I had given this as a mock test, if that was a boom writing test? And the answer has been given by all of you before. No, they wouldn't. My comfort is that for Cambridge proficiency, we have another three topics, uh, another two topics, uh, and three if they have read the book or watched the film. Uh, we don't use the film or the book. Uh, in the last few years, we've stopped trying. We've tried. Uh, I, I've tried until I was blue in the face, but nobody really bothered, so I gave up. Uh, so in this case, I'm confident to say that despite the fact that the topic was difficult, by working on this writing topic, I actually managed to discuss a topic that is not readily and immediately visible to learners. For example, work environments. Uh, I presented vocabulary that is related with this. We worked on the report form and actually we got to work on our speaking skills and even work on um, structures as, such as passive and causative use of have so that the learners could see how things were done without actually naming who did the action. Um, so one thing that becomes clear from this uh, presentation is that it's very important for the learners to have to come to grips with what the topic asks them to do and what they actually feel and think about. Now, there are two issues here. The first thing is that with my teenagers and sometimes with my tertiary level students, um, I'm faced with this disheartening uh, situation where the second paragraph of the text or the first main part paragraph doesn't have a topic sentence, but opens with the bold statement, in my opinion. Uh, and I, I'm quick to tell the learners that your opinion comes second after you have presented the facts. So I usually make a mini poster and put it on uh, our, um, the wall of our classroom. It's uh, facts first, opinion second. And then the learners ask me, but miss, can't I tell my audience a little bit about my opinion? And I tell them, oh, for sure you can, and many writers do so. But if we try many different styles, then you will be confused. Let's follow one path for the first three, four, five essays, reports, whatever we write. And then the more you gain experience, the more you can add personal touches. And once you have resolved the other problems, I can give you feedback on these extra elements. For example, it's not a bad idea to have students give a little bit of a hint about what they their final uh, conclusion will be, as long as they are consistent and they don't uh, turn the tables and go for the other option, uh, come paragraph four or paragraph five. Another problem that we have is that learners think that the assessors, or in this case, me, the teacher, have a set um, of ideas and they should write what I find flattering or what I find to my liking, despite what they think. The outcome of that is that they cannot come with supportive ideas because they frankly don't believe in this. And because they are passionate young people, they cannot think of, you know, counter arguments to something they really support and like. So for me, it's very important to remind my learners that although I tell them that you don't have to tell me your opinion first, 
I need to explain to them that their opinion guides the choice of arguments, the way they prioritize the arguments, and is in the core of the opinion essay, especially when we, we have opinion essays which require the learners to talk about how they see the topic. Um, so if we look into the topic again and the demands that it makes on the learners, they have to write accurately all of that long Venn diagram I explained in a suitable style while thinking of all of the topic in relation to their opinion, ensuring that they do not leave any gaps, they do not uh, discuss one side without discussing the other, that they don't over explain and uh, uh, analyze the problems, but then they do not suggest solutions. Uh, they are they think they need to do that without a plan and they do that while they are being under pressure because they're taking exams. So I think writing qualifies for Mission Impossible in ELP the way it is described. Therefore, we have to find ways to assist learners to understand that this is such a complex, just because this is such a complex task, we need to find other ways to support ourselves and our learning. Once again, I'm going to give you a quiet time. This is a writing task, first uh, part writing task. This comes from uh, Express Publishing once again but this time it's FCE and it's the obligatory task. Thank you for the great ideas, totally agree. It's very difficult for imagination to work on unfamiliar topics. And also it is very difficult for learners to ignore an unknown word in the topic. It, it gnaws and it, it, it chews away and eats away their confidence in what they are doing. Now, discussing this topic, my learners would be around 12 to 13, sometimes 14. Uh, I have to say that in some cases they may have been younger, not my learners, but in, in Greece in general. To what extent, once again, Linkert scale, once one is not interested at all, five very interested, how interested would they be in this topic? You can enter the number in the chat. Any ideas? Mm -hmm. So at least it's better than before. We got a two. Okay, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Rob. But still, it's this type of topic that make learners go, I've got nothing to say. There is nothing that I know that I can relate to. And the problem here, unlike the previous topic, is that there is no getting out of this one they have to write it. Now, an additional challenge here is number three. Uh, when the essay was made the obligatory first part for FCE, I know that Greece gave a very negative feedback. Initially, school owners in Greece uh, were not very excited about this change, going from letter as the obligatory one to FCE, transactional letter, to an essay. Um, of course, Cambridge uh, representatives and trainers who kindly came to school and trained us and talked to us and presented at our conferences uh, specified that the students are guided and there is uh, the aid is given in um, uh, the form of the two uh, notes, the bullet points, and there is only one idea that the students have to think. Uh, so in a way, they are helped and eased into the task. Personally, I beg to differ. I think the fact that they are given the bullet points makes finding the third bullet a lot harder. Uh, first of all, it is um, 
not easy for the learners, and I will say it's not easy for the learners, but please read and, and listen. It is not easy for Maria to think what Maria would like three to be unless I actually plan and start writing the whole thing so that I can see which aspect I haven't covered. The problem is that learners as young as 12 years old under the pressure of exams do not think in this way. They just go head on and they uh, attack, let's say, the, the essay by using one paragraph for the useful skills, one paragraph for encouraging creativity, and then either repeating, uh, adding or not adding a point, and sometimes completely forgetting to add their own voice, to add their own opinion. This might be caused because they are under a lot of stress. It might be because they cannot come up with ideas. Uh, and because they may feel that uh, um, they have already mentioned a new idea, but that idea, when we read the essay, sounds like an explanation, clarification, supportive argument for the other. Um, uh, could you please explain wh what you mean about the, uh, sorry, I thought it was the certificate for first certificate. That's what I thought. Okay. Now, um, so... One of the issues with this was the discussion about art and whether art is a lesson. So in our lesson, we started with this. Uh, which arts do we teach at school? Do you go to a school where art is taught in Greece due to the financial crisis and many other problems with the appointment of teachers? Art lessons have been limited to have this to the point to have disappeared from the uh, curriculum of many um, uh, junior high schools and they were not part of the senior high school at any rate. And now there are issues with uh, primary schools as well. So the discussion about art was something familiar. Which arts do we see? Do you do any drama at school? Uh, do you do um, art in the form of drawing? Is it fair? Should you get grades for these lessons? Should they be assessed? Uh, should there be tests, exams, or whatever? Students talked about this. We also talked about what a school would be like if there was more emphasis in arts. You know, we talked about uh, how many different classrooms they would need so that they would have a music room, uh, perhaps more than one, um, an art room, the kind of investment that parents may have to make so that learners, uh, students can go to school having the uh, materials that they need or even a musical instrument that is portable. So all of these gave rise to the whole discussion and generated some nice juicy vocabulary that we could cook later in our, um, uh, in our writing. Uh, then we took the bullet points bit by bit and we discussed them. So what kind of skills do we learn through the arts? Uh, students came up with ideas such as uh, patience, organization. It was a bit difficult at first because there were disagreements, uh, but then it was understood. Most of them agreed that artists are not, they don't simply draw lines. There is a plan and there is a... Um, there is order in their chaos. Then we talked about creativity and we also practiced paraphrasing these, always reminding learners that um, lifting from the topic is not encouraged. And then learners were asked to come up with their own idea and what they would like to add. Uh, and this was, a, a, let's say, a way to check whether these ideas would stand on their own. Then learners, having that third idea, learners were asked to work in uh, their pairs or groups and pre present to their classmates how they were planning to um, uh, structure their essay, how many paragraphs they were planning to make. Um, there is something that I need to say now. It will become obvious a little bit later as I present um, uh, the way of teaching that I am suggesting today. Uh, I find it interesting that in most exams, and I think that this goes up until IELTS, we can have quite good essays if the students manage to write four paragraphs, in some cases even five paragraphs, but 
For weaker students, suggesting five paragraphs might be daunting. Uh, suggesting three paragraphs might confuse them and they may not know where to fit everything. So it makes sense for me to train them to think of an introduction, a conclusion, and then use the, the topic to help them take what they need to create the main part paragraph. And this is the, let's say, the core methodology that I will be presenting. Um, thank you for the comments. Thank you so much. So it has become apparent, I think, from these two examples that writing cannot be seen as purely writing. I think much like writing asks us to assess all language present and available, we also teach it through every language present and available and through a multimodal way of teaching that has been made easy and available because of technology. So we can start with uh, a video or a reading material. As I was presenting uh, my uh, the first example, the one with the renovation of the premises, I kept thinking something that I hadn't thought of and I didn't do even for today's session because the idea just came to me that I can combine it with a reading on open plan offices and how people are starting to complain that, yes, gamified offices and, you know, having a ball instead of a chair might be a lot of fun for the first half hour and the first half week, but then uh, immediate problems start becoming pressing and people want to go back to their office and their chair. So this is it. We need to get the learners to read and listen about this, this new topic that is knocking on our door. Now, you may say that uh, hasn't your course book done that for you? Both of these, uh, both examples that I mentioned have to do with uh, courses that are built around practice tests. So no, I didn't have a course book that would have done that. But it is also possible no matter how well we've worked on the topic, that we need a little bit more inspiration. Getting the learners to watch a video or to listen, to, to read a quick reading task, gets them to go shopping for ideas and to go shopping for vocabulary. And it generates discussion in class that removes that, that awful feeling that, oh, now I have to write that essay. It also helps them understand the topic in realistic terms. And personally, I like getting them not to answer questions on these videos but, or on the reading material, but to ask questions. Personally, I'm uh, endlessly thankful for the existence and the, the availability of inquiry-based learning. I think that the, the greatest thing we can do for our learners is to arouse their curiosity, make them curious and ask them to ask questions. Why is this important? Why is that? Uh, so if you had to give this reading to another student, which questions would you ask the student? Um, and in this way, they can think of what they find interesting. And of course, the uh, WH questions can exist without even a reading. If we talk about art in schools, um, what would you like to know? What would you ask if you had the Minister of Education here in your classroom? What would you ask them? Okay, so the next thing is that we can see writing as a different tool. So far, writing appears in the eyes of the learners as a test. But I can see that Cambridge take a lot of, they have put in a lot of effort to contextualize the writing tasks, to give us a purpose and a reason. So you've been talking about that in your classroom and now your teacher has asked you to write. So this is the contextualization. If I and all of us as teachers meet this effort halfway, then learners may feel that they are not writing, but they're commenting. In real life, we never write just because. So tomorrow I may take this session, turn it into an article, upload it on my blog or send it to a magazine. The reason I'm doing this is not because 
I have somebody marking me or I have a deadline, it's because I'm interested in sharing ideas. I like writing um, and I feel it would be a good, let's say, follow up thing to do so that the webinar can be well rounded. Uh, this makes my writing more than just writing for testing purposes. Another example, in real life, we write in response to things. Somebody writes to us and we respond. Uh, we write a blog post and somebody comments and then we comment back. And sometimes the comments do not have to be very long. Personally, I found that asking the learners to write short comments the way we write on Facebook or on Twitter is a great way to practice micro writing, which allows me to give immediate feedback. And the more feedback I give, the more the learners have the ability and the opportunity to check ambitious vocabulary and more difficult structures in a protected environment where even if they fail, nothing happens. This is not reflected in their grades and there's no bad blood, there is no worries. Um, the last one is that we get to work on our speaking, provide scaffolding to the learners, which helps them uh, address the topic in the way that they can be, uh, they can be successful. Um, once I heard another trainer say that, and it has stayed with me, nothing succeeds like success. I know it's, it's self-evident, but the more students feel that there is, there is a possibility that I will not get a harpooned document that is you know, shedding blood because there are so many comments, uh, the more likely we are to get more and more work that has been written with a lot of emotion and a lot of thinking without fear of being over-criticized. And of course, during these time when we work uh, on the, uh, let's say, pre-topic introduction stage, uh, we can identify misconceptions. And I said that I have a nice story to share. Um, a few years ago, one of my students, we were discussing issues, environmental issues. She was one of the weaker students in the class, but I never thought that this could be a misconception. So we were talking about alternative energy forms. We were discussing um, solar power, wind power, even uh, whether or not we can use water as a means of producing energy. And somebody mentioned the natural gas and that it's a better solution to burning fossil fuels. And as we were writing arguments, she said, uh, I, I'm totally against natural gas and I do not agree with you because it pollutes the atmosphere, to which I said, of course it does. It is a fossil, it is a fuel after all, but it doesn't produce the pollutants to the same extent. So to cut a long story short, she had totally confused CO2 gases and natural gas. If she had written the essay on her own, and if that had been an, an exam topic, she would have got her wires totally crossed. And the, the whole thing would be very difficult to understand. One would have to read the whole composition to get to the point where one would understand that poor thing has uh, misunderstood. She's, she writes natural gas, but she's thinking CO2 gases. So obviously, this is not the type, I mean, uh, we've been celebrating many uh, decades of communicative language teaching. And as part of that, writing is a process, not a product. So we are very far away from the time when I was a student where we were given a topic and we, we were told that you have to write 120 words. And if you're a good student and study hard, you will do it. But there are still more steps to what we have to do. Thank you so much for the comments. And let's see how we can go from the rubric to the content. Personally, I like to uh, showcase this on the whiteboard as a snake and get the learners to understand how any topic can become more manageable if we devote time to it. So this is not my idea. It is uh, borrowed or stolen from a book that is not anymore in circulation. There is a new edition, but I haven't taught that new edition and I'm not sure that uh, if this has been transferred. The book was Choices B2, and it's um, one of those books that truly trains the teacher to teach. And um, it's 
as I mentioned, the old edition, and it referred to the previous format of uh, the FCE exam, of the B2 exam. But this Abbott uh, abbreviation is so clear. First of all, it's easy to remember. And it starts with analyze. And for me, it's a key uh, piece of information to get the learners to tell me what we mean by analyze. How do we analyze the topic? And when we get to the point where they say we highlight, I have to remind them, how much do you highlight? Greek learners have this uh, tendency to take the highlighter and simply paint everything yellow, bright lime, blue, you name it. Problem is, the more we highlight, the less we actually highlight. If we highlight the whole topic, we've highlighted nothing. So there is no point to it. Therefore, this is our time to practice critical thinking skills which are the truly important bits that you need to remember? Which are the truly important bits you need to stress? Who are you writing to? Who, who are your readers? How does the reader affect the style of the topic, you're, of the text you're going to produce? After we go past this, we need to start brainstorming. And in this case, we can see that all the anticipated problems start cropping up. Do the learners understand the topic well? Do they have ideas to present? Are their ideas relevant? Another problem that we have, if you look across different publishers, both C2 and uh, B2 level, the most popular exam levels, you'll notice that there are about 50 or 60 variations of topics related with technology, technology in education, uh, Facebook and social media. The problem is that all these blend into one. The learners see one or two key words, but they don't actually study the topic. They don't spend time brainstorming and carried away by what they have done in a previous essay. They just regurgitate a topic that has nothing to do, a topic response that has nothing to do with what they are doing. So brainstorming is actually great. And um, one thing that I tell my learners is that the muscle here, the brain, needs a little bit time of time to warm up. So the first few ideas might be predictable, not exciting, uh, really, really repetitive. Don't worry. The more you keep at it, the more great ideas are going to come up. And this is what happens. Great ideas come up. And learners learn how to organize things into paragraphs. So they come up with three or four ideas. They organize them into paragraphs. And then they think of time. At this point, I would like to mention that the organization into paragraphs falls under sustainable writing, which I'm going to present in a sec. So there is no end to the nagging that I get from students when we are about to start doing writing. Miss, I have no idea how to start. Miss, I have no ideas at all. Miss, I don't like the topic. So to find a way to get them out of this, I had to come up with a way that would make writing sustainable. So first of all, we start with genre analysis. Sometimes with C2 students, I present an overview of the topics, of the types of topics that they have to read, to write. We study the rubrics and we come up with an analysis of what kind of text they have to write. Then I teach them to create the building blocks of the topic. So what we do in class is based on the topic, first of all, we analyze the model, but we structure the introduction, the conclusion, and the main part paragraphs based on a, I will use this uh, publishing term, based on a style sheet. So what should be in each of these paragraphs? Therefore, I have to teach them the structure of the paragraphs, the structure and the importance of the topic sentences. The more I 
focus on that, the more I help them understand that first, they do not need endless ideas. They need an introduction, a conclusion, which are based on the things that they are given and the things they have said, respectively. And they need about two ideas in each paragraph, and they are okay with that, the more they feel uh, relaxed. Secondly, if they know how they're going to go about it, they have a well-walked route, a pathway which they have taken time and time again, they are not experimenting. They just start writing. They can plan based on this and they can start writing immediately. The downside of this way of teaching is that it can be accused of being prescriptive. Uh, it is a valid criticism to say you are stifling their creativity. You don't let them develop their own way of writing. Of course, I do allow them to uh, uh, veer away from the given, uh, let's say, style sheet as long as they have mastered it. If they haven't mastered it, I ask them to stick to it so that they have somewhere to fall back on. It's a safe beginning and it helps them to improvise safely later. And as I mentioned, it gives us opportunities for micro writing. Uh, it's very important because it makes writing sustainable for me. The quality of the samples, the writing samples that I collect is progressively better and better. And I don't have to hit my head hard and say, oh my God, what are they writing? And how, how am I going to make this mess uh, make sense? So if I can give you an example, uh, I will present a skeleton introductory paragraph or the style sheet for the introductory paragraph. Uh, personally, I, I'm fed up. I have no patience anymore with sentences like example related with the second topic. Learning about art is important, nothing else. And then the next paragraph starts, in my opinion. And of course, I would start that I would comment next to that incomplete and insufficient introduction. So why are you telling me this? So what I teach learners is that an introductory paragraph starts by paraphrasing the topic. And this takes us a quite some getting used to. We may add one supportive or clarifying sentence. As you can see, the brackets are because I'm dealing with two different levels. Uh, for FC, it might not be necessary. For C2, it adds depth. Then we have to present the different voices. And here is that the students say, Miss, do the topics always have uh, have a different voice? And I'm like, of course they do, because if there were there weren't different voices, you wouldn't be debating. You wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a discursive point to write about. And then Depending on the level, we might go for a simplified thesis statement or a rhetoric question. I said the simplified thesis statement because obviously this is not the kind of the thesis statement that I would use for a, a dissertation, a thesis at master's level, so on and so forth. But then again, these are secondary students writing for language exams. It might even be a rhetoric question, but it helps to bridge. And learners know that there will be one rhetoric question and it will be placed in this specific part because it bridges the topic to the next. So this is our style sheet. And when I said about micro writing, as I mentioned, I use a variety of tasks to get the learners to see what the genres are like, what kind, the level of formality. Um, I may use different topics and ask them to write only the introduction. And we design it together, then they start writing on their own. I give feedback, they improve it. And this writing workshop means that they soon master the art of writing introductions. And perhaps I ha can have a headache less because they won't say, so Miss, how do I start? Where do I start from? So that would be an example. The question whether arts should be a school subject is a hotly debated one. That would be the sentence that paraphrases. Some parents and students believe that the arts can help students receive a better rounded education, while others consider them extracurricular activities which should not take time from other subjects. This essay sets out to examine both views before a personal opinion is expressed. Now, Regarding the thesis, I have substitution tables created. I give them some worksheets. We do work in class and I try to teach it 
I focus more uh, on the thesis statement with my proficiency classes rather than with the uh, B2. But for the B2s as well, it's a it's a very nice way for them to finish the first paragraph and move on to the next. And it also shows the aim of the paragraph. Why is this vi viable and uh, sustainable? First of all, it makes learners ready to tackle any topic. They know that they have to start with Abbott and then they know what a main part paragraph should include, what an introduction includes, what a conclusion includes, and they have those steps and stages to follow. It helps them uh, build a body of knowledge that is relevant to writing so they can afford to plan. They are not out there battling that monster of writing on their own. They don't need to waste time. They feel that they have a safe uh, route to walk back home. The micro writing uh, sessions also supply a lot of feedback. So they are mini rehearsals and it's easier for me to give feedback uh, because it's so uh, it's not time consuming. And they spend more time on their writing, not on analyzing the model. Having said that, I'm not in favor of having learners memorize models, obviously, but I believe that models are useful. I sometimes use the models provided by uh, the practice tests if there are some and if I like them. If not, I write them. Actually, this is an idea presented in a Tissot Macedonia Thrace conference by Cliff Parry uh, way back when, I think it was 2006 or 2007. And he mentioned that the, the teacher is the best person to write the model, but at the same time, we can get the learners to pre prepare a corrected version of their essay and keep it as a model. And this is a sustainable model. Now, talking about sustainability, when I started teaching writing, the C2 level course books gave such impossible models that no learner would ever produce. These days, materials publisher, materials designers and publishers have given us better material to work with, closer to the reality of the learners. We don't want the, the model to be this incomprehensible thing that the learners cannot understand or have the chance to produce. But also, we have to wonder whether the exam board specifications and guidelines are followed. An example. I know that in modern journalism, and can be the beginning of a sentence, much like but in my book, it's not. And I tell my learners that Kulinger awarded uh, award winning writers may do so and they may get away with it. But you're not a Kulinger <laughs> award winning writer. So um, until you become, please follow structures and punctuation and, you know, follow the rules. At the same time, we see many publishers include and and but at the beginning of sentences. We also see many publishers and published material start paragraphs without topic sentences with moreover or in addition, which might be stylistically interesting if one is writing for the general audience. But in terms of preparing a, a piece of writing that will be assessed, it may set a dangerous example. Uh, some years ago, before COVID, I think it was the beginning of 2020, almost uh, three years ago, um, the Hellenic American Union invited uh, the, the head assessor uh, from uh, Michigan at Ann Arbor, because Michigan exams are very popular in Greece, and she gave us practical examples and an analysis of the marking scale and the marking scheme, and she specifically mentioned that they want topic sentences consisting of words and uh, rhetoric devices that help the flow of the text. They do not want uh, enumeration uh, devices. They don't want uh, on the one hand, on the other. They do not want heavy, uh, however, or having said that, they simply want topic sentences. So yes to models, as long as the model actually offers learners good example and it assist their scaffolding. In the case that I mentioned before, with the very difficult ones, it didn't assist. There is always the fear that it might lead to blind copying and deprive the learners of their authenticity and their personal voice. But to be honest, I prefer this to learners resorting to parents who ask them to either copy or use GPT or 
use dictionaries or translate from their mother tongue and produce something which is incomprehensible uh, and doesn't assist. The whole point is who writes the model. And I think it should be, uh, it could be the course book, it might be the teacher, or it might be the learner who creates a personal portfolio based on the evaluated material that he or she has received. The final thing I would like to show has to do with one of the most complex writing tasks. I'm aware of the time I'm finishing. Um, it's the Cambridge Part 1 essay writing, which is, of course, as complex as they come. Learners have to study two excerpts, and they have to do a lot. They have to highlight uh, the main ideas, uh, two main ideas in each, understand if the topics are complementary or contradictory, and create their own piece of writing by summarizing, evaluating, expressing their own voice while paraphrasing. A mouthful for me to report, let alone for the young ones to do. In this case, what I did was use the actual example that Cambridge have, um, the student's example, but I didn't give the learners uh, the, the actual marks. This was an opportunity for the learners to get to understand what the um, descriptors are. So what are these criteria? What do they reflect? What is communicative achievement? How is it difficult from language? Uh, what's the difference between content and organization? And after we worked on these, they were given a red pen and asked to mark it, to work through this and mark the, uh, the essay. Now, as you can see, um, this uh, uh, they were really interested in that because they didn't just mark it, they actually gave it lower marks. When we finished, they got to compare their marks to the marks of the assessors, and they actually read the comments that the assessors made, which in a way gave them hope because they had been stricter and the assessors had been, uh, let's say, more uh, open to the fact that mistakes will occur. So the pre-writing stage of this sustainable process is to help learners analyze, then brainstorm so that we can think pair and share, follow Scrivener's way. Then learners are given some exposure to planning. Then they spend time selecting and rejecting ideas. And they learn how to use the plan, the sustainable plan as a style sheet. And they get training in identifying what goes, the, uh, in um, identifying the aim of each paragraph. For post writing, they work on their editing skills, we may play mistakes hunt, in which case I take sentences that had issues and we try to fix them. Or sometimes we take whole paragraphs and we try to see how this can work. Learners may be um, involved in self-reflective tasks such as what could I have done to change this? Was it the time that I dedicated? Was it something that I didn't understand? Should I have made the, the plan clear? So to, sus to create sustainable writing practices, uh, we need to thread skills. We can benefit from teaching the genre to the learners. Topic awareness can only help them. And it helps to guide learners towards process writing, not product writing. Uh, sustainable writing sadly feels prescriptive and even suffocating at times, but at least it helps learners create content before they can personalize it. And learners are not discouraged to create their personal style, but once they acquire experience and they can resort to personal expression. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, it has been so such intense webinar as usual with you that there are so many things to reflect on. So uh, I'm sure that all of us, or at least most of us will be willing to listen to you again in the recorded version. So uh, thank you once again, and let's keep in touch. Of course, of course, it's, it's never goodbye. It's, never, it's goodbye. never goodbye. It's see you again. And I will try to come to Poland. Where is the